Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about a popular topic. I say popular, but it's really someone asking in the YouTube comments so persistently. They wore me down and had me do a video on it, but I think there's some real reasons I should cover this. Uh, it is the OpenSense versus PFSense debate. It comes up a lot specifically, as I said, on YouTube, occasionally on Twitter, and of course, there's two places on Reddit, one for PFSense, one for OpenSense. And I think there's some ping-ponging back and forth between the home lab people of who makes the best firewall and why their answer is the best. Now, I'm going to weigh in on this, and I will at least let people know, as if you didn't already, that we are a longtime user of PFSense and don't plan on right now here in May of 2021 changing that. I bring that up because time matters when it comes to context of whether or not we like a product. There's products I don't like from the past. Uh, but I liked them then. And right now I still like PFSense. That's still my position on things. We still plan to keep deploying and using it, but that's right now. If you catch me 10 years from now because a thing changed, hey, why not? This is why we have dates on videos and this is the experience in May of 2021. Before we dive into this and all the details, which will of course be linked down below so you can just skip ahead to the time index that interests you the most if that's what you'd like to do, let's talk about the sponsor of today's video, me. If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hire us button right at the top. If you'd like to support this channel in other ways, there's affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about and other ways to connect with us. Except you won't find an affiliate link to NetGate or PFSense. We are not a reseller. We're also not a reseller of OpenSense, but that was probably obvious by anyone who's followed this channel for any length of time because we don't really do OpenSense videos. But not being a reseller is one of our ways we've always kept a separation and just wasn't lucrative for us to become a reseller. Matter of fact, by telling people, and this is frequently for a lot of the products that are not channel partner, we tell people, go ahead and buy the product directly from, you know, XYZ company, or in this case, if you want to buy a NetGate appliance. And our task is frequently to integrate, not just the PSN's firewall or do consulting with it, but usually an overall network stack. It's a lot of what we do is build and engineer these things for companies, for internal IT teams, and even for small businesses, or even people building different you know, labs and things like that. We offer a range of consulting services and PFSense has been one of the things that we consult on, but we have done consulting on OpenSense as well, but not being a reseller, I just wanna be upfront. So this is not paid for or endorsed by either of those companies. I sponsor this video and the video is my own thoughts. Now, the first thing we'll talk about though is the common ancestor of PFSense and OpenSense, which is Monowall. In the early days, in the before times, in the earliest times of technology, as it feels, because it was so many years ago now, uh, and technology iterates fast, there was a move towards some of these different types of open source firewalls, or just basically completely software defined firewalls using old hardware. There was actually a lot of competitors in the early market for this in the 2000s. And maybe one day I'll dive into the history of all of them because it might be really fun. But Monowall was among those. And Monowall was a really cool project based on BSD versus a lot of the other ones at the time were based on Linux. There's some cool features that BSD had ahead of Linux back then uh, for large scalable systems. So you've seen a lot of enterprise use of this because it could do things the other other systems couldn't, and it could do it without some of the, you know, hardware and licensing that came with some of the enterprise offerings of that time. Swing it all the way now, most firewalls are more software defined than they are hardware defined, but uh, not to get too off topic on that, but it's it's changed a lot in the market over the last 20 years. But Monowall is defunct. PFSense was the fork of that code that took over the project to carry it on. Then comes OpenSense, who, like all things in open source, when a group of developers can't agree on something, fork it, man, just fork it. And this is what happened in 2014. I think the first original release was 2015. So uh, there's obviously some arguing that went back and forth. This is how these go. Uh, I'm not going to dive into it, but I'm sure there's forum posts people can watch and developers argue and have different opinions. But the fork. Why did they fork? Let's read their words right here from the OpenSense page, which is back in 2014, after having sponsored PFSense for years, we felt there was no other option than to fork the project to keep the spirit of the original monowall based fork alive. Below, you can read about the original motivations and the birth of OpenSense. So they, you know, cover this here. One of the reasons, though, that is kind of funny, and these are some of the arguments, and they, there is some validity to this of saying, hey, the GUI should not perform tasks that require root access, and that's something they were going to fix. So this is back in like 2015. 
but here we are, and I have both of these, OpenSense, we'll get to the interfaces shortly here, uh, but I have both OpenSense and PFSense virtualized, so we can talk about this, uh, but right here is logged into OpenSense and everything's still running as root. You can go through their code commits and read. They say it's because they brought over so much legacy code. It's one of those things like I get the goal, like, hey, we want to separate things and do things differently, but it ended up that they still haven't really changed over from that seven years later. And I just want to bring this up because this is where the comments uh, come in when I do a PFSense video, but I want to address it. It's not that they are more or less secure. They're much the same because they're still running things things the way PFSense did, the way PFSense still does now. And that's just because it's really difficult to write it in a different manner. The other thing we want to talk about is their choice of hardened BSD versus your standard free BSD. This is another talking point that people think make OpenSense substantially different than PFSense. And while they're still based on it right now, they are parting ways and moving away from it as of April of 2021. But I wanted to bring this up because there are differences and it's not a bad thing that they were using that, but it just comes down to implementation. This is where it gets a little bit more nuanced. Both projects are secure. Both projects have good track history of security. So whether they implemented it as PFSense has done with standard BSD and then apply their own compilation tweaks to it and you know fine tune things, or you start with the patches from hardened BSD, they are different approaches, but they both have achieved in both products. I can't name any major security breaches. Now there's always security fixes and a lot of these security fixes came from the underlying tools and open source things that they integrated in there. You know, for example, there was a problem with Unbound at one point in time and both projects were using it, but the way it was compiled means it was not something that was immediately exposed or uh, a default config that could have been a problem. Matter of fact, I believe it was the way it handled some of the DNSSEC as a while ago, but this is just an example. But both projects, because they are based on a lot of the same BSD packages, that type of security problem still occurred, but both of them, because of the mitigations they have, didn't really have any problems directly from it. So this is where there's a little bit of nuance and you know it's a bold statement, but it actually in reality, as long as you're implementing it properly and writing secure code is hard, uh, as long as you're doing that all properly, yes, it should work great. Now on to the controversial topic that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because, you know, flame wars have nothing to do with technology, but boy, do people love them. And let's talk about that. And I'm only gonna talk about it briefly because what happened was you have the fork of OpenSense. Now, I think there's always more to the story that we just don't have the full context for of everything that happened. We can see externally what did happen in the court of law because there's published papers on this. The folks over at, or specifically, I believe his name is Jim over at uh, Deckgate did typo, not typo squat, domain squat. It's not really a typo. They had opensense.org, he registered opensense.com and squatted on it, essentially saying OpenSense sucks. Childish behavior. I don't condone this at all. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's just childish. But uh, not as an excuse, I am once again being very clear. I don't condone this behavior. I think people make mistakes. I think people make horrible choices. Uh, this was one of them. And that case was ruled against them and they had to surrender domain back over to OpenSense. And the reason I think we're missing some of the nuance there is NetGate is the foundation that sells hardware that funds the developers that develop PFSense and that hardware funding, you know, people say, oh, why does the NetGate product cost X? Well, that extra money over the actual cost of the physical product that goes into software development is what gets you the PFSense software and what gets all the other things that NetGate sponsors. And that's one of those little nuances that shouldn't be glossed over too much that NetGate spends a lot of money sponsoring and paying some of these developers to develop the BSD kernel and other open source projects. I just know this because I know some of the people that are you know, working there or working on the payroll that work on BSD con contributions. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that, you know, all the software should be free, but the reality is it still takes very skilled developers to write this and someone has to pay their bills. It turns out their computer isn't free, their electric bill and utilities aren't free. So they may have some free time, but they still have to eat and they still have to buy the technology that they type on to write the code. So there has to be money somewhere or it becomes a hobby project. And unfortunately, when some projects are less supported, they, well, fall by the wayside and lack features. And BSD is an ecosystem that is substantially smaller than the Linux. The Linux world is very much propped up by many commercial enterprises, you know, Google and Red Hat and IBM and all these other companies do massive 
contributions that end up in the kernel end up everywhere else on Linux. The BSD community is a lot smaller with a fewer number of developers. And the two biggest projects I can think of, well, three, I guess, if you count Netflix, uh, who does use BSD in their back end, but you have IX Systems and the PF Sense and, of course, OpenSense. And those are the big projects that are on the BSD front. Everything else, and I know there'll at least be one or two comments, but isn't IX Systems starting uh, TrueNAS Scale, which is also based on Debian? Yeah, so they're going to have, uh, you know, development on both sides. But back to the point, uh, BSD development costs money and NetGate is contributing to it. I don't really know, or at least I couldn't find. I'm not saying OpenSense isn't. I just couldn't really find it. But they are both backed by hardware company because, by the way, OpenSense has another hardware company. I don't know how to say it. It's D-E-S-I-C-O. Um, but they sell appliances that fund the development of OpenSense. So there's a very similar uh, business model that both of these have. And here we go high quality Dutch engineering. And we don't really run into many of these over here in the US, but I believe my thoughts would be they're probably more popular in Europe because being that it's based over there, um, I've had people complain that there's, you know, cause I'm not an uh, expert on this, but when you import some of the devices from the US over there, there's a lot of fees that may get added onto it versus things you buy directly in the EU. But that's uh, certainly outside of what I do every day. But they do, like I said, have some more business models on there. All right, now back to finalizing this. They surrendered the domain over and OpenSense got OpenSense.com and everyone loves to uh, complain about this controversy. I, I think it's uh, something that they regret doing, but hey, take it for what it's worth. Uh, I'm willing to move on and forgive when someone makes a horrible mistake. Because if I hated every software where someone was just an ass, that's all I can say, I would probably not use any software at all. Software development is peppered with people who are uh, less than good behavior, but hopefully regret it, grew up and became more adult later. All right, moving on to some technical topics. And I do consider this somewhat of a technical topic, and it, this is kind of where my leanings are for uh, PF Sense. It's a job search. I know job search doesn't sound like a technical topic, but hear me out. Technical people using PF Sense. I have covered this before, and there's something that I'm under NDA for that I can't talk about, which is the large companies that have hired us to help integrate PF Sense with some of their other systems. The same thing with NetGate. Many companies, when they buy products, they don't want you to know what product stack they're using. They don't disclose that all the time. This is why when you look at some of the larger companies, you're becoming quieter and quieter about the technology, because from a security standpoint, this reduces threat surface. Because if you know that a company is running any particular stack, and then you know there's a flaw in that stack, now you have a vector of attack to potentially go after that company because you're like, hey, cool, there's a flaw in this product and we know the target that we're looking for uses that product. This can be one of the reasons like they obscure it. But I bring that up. The way you can sometimes find out what stacks companies are using is by looking at the job postings. And when you look at the job postings, I put an open sense over here in Indeed, which I think is probably more focused on the US. Maybe there's a way I could look in Europe and it would be a little bit different, but I don't see many of these open sense systems uh, operations people being hired. Matter of fact, I find it interesting. I, I think that um, there's just it more like mentioning, like, do you know some of the open sense stuff in here? And there's like a little bit in here. But when you look at the job offerings for PF Sense, there's 58 job listings for people looking for PF Sense. And I bring this up because one, we've run into it in the wild very frequently. Like we've taken over, you know, random client that needed IT help or uh, they lost their IT admin and they need someone to take over and we'll find a PF Sense device in there or software defined or however they've got it loaded, whether they bought it from NetGate or virtualized or anything else in between. That is very, very common. We run into these at data centers. We have just been in them and noticed, hey, look, a NetGate, a NetGate, a NetGate. They're really common in there when we're at colo locations. I've seen a lot of them out there. I just have never seen anything from OpenSense. And like I said, maybe because they're more European, but this is also where my start came from in using PFSense is at a bank in around 2014. 14 or 15 uh, was a banking system. And we were surprised to learn that their system had it. And we, so it's a little bit of consulting that was going on back then. And uh, we, like I said, we've run into it a wild constantly. And, you know, we just see a lot more for it. So it's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm so well versed in it. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the same thing going for the job thing. Now, that is not a reason not to use OpenSense, but it's just a, you know, my perspective of how much we run into it and one of the reasons we stay kind of focused on it. So now we can get into the actual technical topics and looking at the interfaces, because I know what a lot of people want to do is talk about what makes it really different. And what makes it really different is this dashboard that looks different here than it does here, right? 
Well, this is where the nuance is, and this is where a lot of engineering went into OpenSense to change things. The big change is the interface. It's a lot different. The underlying technology is the same. This is one of the reasons that they're both solid solutions for firewalls is because they're still based on BSD. They're still based on a lot of the same core functionality at the bottom, but how you address and how you get to that functionality is where the nuances start coming in. So the dashboards do look a little bit different, um, but also look kind of the same in some ways when you start at the dashboard. So if we started the dashboard here, uh, you know, WAN, LAN services and go over here, very, very similar. Now let's look at something like the firewall and NAT rules. If we go over here or we can go over here, this is part of the experience you get. We can go to firewall and, uh, or we can even type in NAT and, uh, cool. Now, PF Sense, no such universal search bar. This is where if you're starting from ground zero and you've never used one of these before, uh, either one of these devices, there may be where you find the open sense a little bit easier because you can just use the universal search without having to go through the menus such as firewall NAT. Now that is one of those things that's just gonna be different. So actually let's start with this rule here. Let's look at the WAN rule because I may have a very similar rule in both and uh, it's the open up to the outside world rule. And this is the allow firewall rule. Let's edit this one. And actually we'll go here and go to rules. We'll go to WAN. And then here's our, you know, what allows me to remotely access this. I'm on the outside of both of these networks. Action pass. We have the option to disable the rule. Interface, direction in, protocol. And let's actually go show hide the advanced options. Um, there's just all these features here, you know, TCP flags and things like that. Scroll down. Interface, address, protocol, disable the rule. Source, destination, logging, display advanced. TCP flags, they both have tagging. So we have the tag options right here. Tagging is actually a pretty cool feature where you can tag a rule to then have it processed by a second rule, essentially chaining rules together. Uh, but there's just some neat stuff that's in here that both of them have because other than a slight interface design when it comes to writing a lot of the rules they're very similar and much the same the only thing that becomes a little bit different and i haven't researched how they handle it but they do handle it is like how they do the qos it's done a little bit differently because you can do your qos in and out pipes uh and queues here for things but overall like i said other than slight implementation differences they're very very similar now let's go back over to nat rule because this is where they did diverge a bit and here is the remote access to a system behind it and we'll edit this rule. This was confusing and they say filter rule association. Now to explain what a filter rule association is, when you NAT something, you bring it in and we wanna redirect uh, port 22 on the WAN side of the firewall and bring it to, forwarding it with NAT translation to a device behind there. So it hits port 22 on the device behind there. There's actually a two-step process that goes on and some firewalls consolidated into a single step or obscure, especially the consumer ones are known for obscuring it. You just port forward something. There's actually the port forwarding option and then there's the allowing that rule to happen on WAN, the filter rule that happens. They've done this in PF Sense. If we go over to firewall NAT and we look at this right here, they have done it by filter association rule and we have a click to say view the filter rule and here is the filter rule versus the net rule i'm confused because there's the rule for filter association rule that says i should create a filter rule that passes it but where the confusion comes in is when we go over to rules and we go over to wan that rule doesn't exist over here, which causes me a little bit of confusion. But these little nuances are some of the differences that sometimes make it difficult when people say, Tom, why don't you do more OpenSense videos? I'm like, I'd have to learn some of these nuances. Now you can usually reverse engineer and sort this out, but I also consulted a documentation which wasn't clear on this. This is one of the things that I did kind of notice is the documentation isn't quite as thorough in OpenSense as it is in PFSense to address those changes. The underlying system may be the same, but the nuances do kind of matter for, you know, if you want to make sure you're doing all these things right. All right, now let's talk about the alias system. They actually both have an alias system. So firewall aliases, we can do IP, we can do ports, we can do URLs. They did the same thing here, but once again, there's the nuances of how they change it to make it a little bit different. But this may come down to preference for how you want to do it. They group them all here. You hit the little plus, and they're just done differently where you do a pull down here instead of a series of tabs. GOIP, URL tables, 
I was actually at first slightly confused about how they did this, but it turns out you do it this way. So once again, they do offer aliases. They do have port aliasing and all those features implemented slightly differently. And uh, that's a little bit of the nuance. Now, what about an intrusion detection system? Do they have that? Yes, there is intrusion detection. So if we go over here to services, intrusion detection, administration, or did it not go? There we go. Intrusion detection, they have this. Now, the difference between the way it's implemented is you get to use Sericata. You only get to use Sericata versus in PFSense, you install a package. It's not natively installed. It is a separate package, but you get to choose which package you want. They're both official, whether it's the Snort package or the package uh, for Sericata. So you have two options. They're using Sericata and OpenSense, and both are great. So uh, that's just a nuance. If you have a preference for Snort, sorry, it's not available. You can only use Sericata in there. Now, I did notice too, I could be me of not knowing where everything is. It feels like there's a lot more fine tuning that can be done and a lot more uh, options you can dig into for here. But like I said, it could be just me not knowing in open sense where it is. But overall, they both do have that feature. Now, let's talk about QoS and the traffic shaper. So here's a traffic shaper. Here's a wizard for the traffic shaper. We, we can go through and enter a number of WAN interfaces. Uh, this is virtualized and doesn't have proper alt Q. Um, so it does give an error because it can't do alt Q on this particular interface, but they just call it shaper inside of here. You have uh, pipes, cues, and rules. I didn't see a wizard, um, but they do have the ability here to create some of the rules. I'm less familiar with how it works in here, but nonetheless, it is an available option in here and they do have coddle queue. So that's good. VPN options. This is interesting because there are different ways, apparently, the way it handles WireGuard. And WireGuard is one of those little controversial ones. So yes, it has it, but it's got WireGuard Go implemented currently. But my understanding is they're moving over to the kernel WireGuard. Now, this is a development version of PFSense. And let's talk about the WireGuard situation real quick here. In the 2.5 version, it came out. In the 2.51, it was removed. The reason why was there were some code problems found. Let's swing all the way over here to the code commits by Jason Donefield. And this is where some of that confusion comes in. Um, I'll leave a link to it so you can read. So I'm not going to read you all the code commits on there, but I'll leave a link so you can go through it. What happened was the team over at NetGate hired a developer that, yes, they hired someone who did not do a great job, apparently, of writing the code, but did do a lot of the code writing. And that's a sponsored project that went into the BSD kernel that now anyone who uses the BSD kernel, i.e. OpenSense, is going to be able to use that code. And you're saying, no, Jason Donefield's writing it. And Jason Donefield imported all the code. And that's actually, he took the code that was written and then made the changes. Now, I know someone will say it was terrible, it was broken, et cetera, et cetera. But you can actually look through the commits if you understand how code works and see the incremental and small changes. Now, incremental and small changes, it doesn't take much code change to change something from, hey, you've broke something and made a port open or offered an insecure uh, way for something to happen, which was also kind of an edge case with an MTU uh, problem. If you use an oversized MTU that won't even transport across the internet and accepted that MTU with the special filter rule, yes, you could buffer overrun the particular uh, experience in there. And that was one of the things they did. They had a couple of race condition issues, but it mostly is the same code that's now in here that's been ported back and brought into FreeBSD for both projects to now enjoy or any project that runs on BSD. So it's coming back as a package in 2.6, but it is available as a Go implementation currently in OpenSense, but my understanding is they are going to be moving to that kernel implementation. So, hey, I'm so glad someone sponsored the code because they got the ball rolling because it wasn't happening without someone being paid to do it. So that's kind of the bottom line on that. Now moving on to the next topic. And that's OpenVPN. Once again, much the same. So if we look at OpenVPN, which is long time well-established and still a very popular VPN for managing remote users. And we look through all the options they have in here, like TLS authentication and certificate management and all these checkboxes, plus the ability to add advanced features. Let's go ahead and look at our test VPN here. Yep, much the same. Now, I didn't check to see if absolutely everything was in feature parity here, but you get the idea that they're very similar, which is, of course, when I've done many videos on OpenVPN, people say, hey, I was able to use your video to figure out how to make the same thing happen inside of OpenSense because they're very similar uh, to the way they work. And of course, they do have IPsec in here as well. Same thing, tunnel settings, RSA key pairs, etc. Next topic is package management. This is where 
there's definitely a lot of the same packages. So we'll go over to the package manager in here. And we'll look for uh, HA proxy. And this is one of them we can load. So we hit the little plus here if we want to load HA proxy. Um, you can also do the let's encrypt with Acme. So it's cool. Once again, something else we have. And we have those over here installed. I don't think I've installed here, but it's system and uh, package manager. Type in proxy. All right, cool. We can uh, find different proxies or specifically we can find uh, HA proxy in here. What? Maybe, I, yeah, it is right there. So there's HA proxy if you want to put it in. So that's a popular feature I've mentioned I really like on PFSense. But yes, it does exist. Not used it, but it does exist over in the OpenSense world as well. And once again, that's pretty cool. The one thing where we have a big divergence, though, is in this. PF blocker. Hugely popular project on PFSense. There's not a direct equivalent that I'm aware of because PF Blocker natively does not exist in OpenSense, but that package is different. But you may have noticed or maybe seen it flipping through here. We have this installed. Now, this is a separate third party package, but can be loaded through their package manager called uh, Sensi, and it's pretty neat. I don't know a ton about it. I play with it a little bit. It gives you some cool graphs and tells you where people went. It has some filtering options when you pay a subscription for it, and it's a cool add-on here. There's not an equivalent in PFSense to this particular package uh, for doing this filtering. I don't know much more than the review that you can probably find here, a feature comparison of the OpenSense plugin by Sensi by Sunnyway Valleys by the Home Network guy. And uh, the Home Network guy, uh, I will leave a link to this particular review. And he goes down and dives into all the features that it has that is more extensive than I've taken the time to research. But uh, he appears to have uh, done a lot more time in it. So if you want to read more about this particular plugin and this description seem reasonable to it, uh, it is a cool feature on OpenSense that does not exist in PFSense. So that's worth mentioning. On to the diagnostics. Let's talk about PF Top. I love PF Top because PF Top allows me to do things like type in host and uh, go like, I think I can type that host. Which one? Yeah, there we go. We see some connections here. Um, go here. There's one for this. All right. I like using PF Top when I'm doing research to try to figure out what's connecting to what and trying to trace things out. It's a great tool. And someone's probably already said, yeah, doesn't OpenSense have PF Top? Well, yes, but they just dump the list and don't give you a way to filter it. So that's kind of a one nuisance I did find right off the top here when I started looking at diagnostics. Secondly, diagnostics. There's a lot of them here inside of PFSense. So, but they're all in one place. So I have all these options here and I can even do cool things like execute a shell command and, you know, uh, halt the system and reset to defaults and edit a file and everything else. It's a little more confusing how they did it. At least to me it is. And this is my opinion. Of course, someone may think this is better. There is a subcategory of diagnostics. There's system diagnostics, which are going to be under system, then diagnostics, interface diagnostics, firewall diagnostics. And it's just a different way of grouping the tools. So at first I was confused as to where those things were because I'm used to using menus, not using a universal search, but maybe that's just the way I am. And because I spent too much time, I personally do like it better in one list, but that's just the way they designed it. Uh, but props to the open sense people, because I've always thought this was stupid in PF sense, and I know they've gotten plenty of people complaining about this before, is we have a power option to reboot or power it off. In PF sense, to me, that absolutely belongs in this short little system menu. That would make a whole lot of sense. Where do I restart this thing? I should be able to go to system and have a power. Do I want to reboot it or do I want to, you know, turn it off? But PF sense has insisted that's a diagnostic tool, which I guess in some ways it is. We reboot things because we're not sure what went wrong, so we reboot it to see if it fixes all the problems we're having. Um, and this is just true for most things in tech, but they've decided to have halt system and reboot system uh, under diagnostics. So I definitely will give props to OpenSense for fixing that when they did the new UI, because that's where it belongs. I don't know that it needs its own separate menu, but I think it should be a system function, not a diagnostic function. But that's my opinion again. And uh, clearly the people over at NetGate or PFSense developers don't agree with me. Maybe someone does, but Anyways, it's it's such a minor problem. Honestly, uh, once in production, we rarely ever reboot a firewall except for, for updates. Now, I want to talk about logging. System logging. The logging seems a little bit more dispersed in here, and it 
became a little bit more confusing for me to just see all the logs. I am favoring the way the logs are done here, um, where they're just tabular and I can go through all the different logs in one place to be able to dive into things. This just, um, yeah, it's kind of a consolidated here and in here i don't know it just feels like it's not but the good news is i know there is a way to push all the logging somewhere else so if i push the logs out somewhere that would probably do it but i'm not sure where that is but the logging just feels like system gateway log file they've dispersed it because kind of the way they did diagnostic each one's a subheading under each thing so it made it a little bit trickier to go through log files but because we do a lot of troubleshooting this is why i think about this we actually spend a lot of time looking at you know diagnostics and log files because if someone calls us for a consulting project on integrating to our network it's not because it's integrated into your network it's because they're having a problem with it so troubleshooting is a huge piece of the consulting work that we end up doing and having in one place does make my life a lot easier. And one minor little thing I'll mention, I do like that they've integrated the NetFlow right here into the system as opposed to having it as a plugin. It's a plugin inside of PFSense. You can use NTOP PNG to dive into some of the NetFlow data and look at it, but they did integrate it natively with uh, NetFlow and then you tell it to either use an external destination server, or you tell it to use localhost here, which gives you some insight into some of the traffic uh, with literally what's called insight right here. Uh, this can be helpful when you wanna look at certain aspects of things on the WAN or the LAN, uh, how things in traffic and what IP addresses or do some reverse lookup on some of the IP addresses that it is reaching out and touching. Do this, it'll pause a second and do that. You can do this with NTOP, but like I said, it's an add-on plugin in the packages that you can load for uh, PFSense, but it's natively built into here. But overall, the reporting on this with the traffic reports and things like that are very similar, once again, to what you can do here, looking at packets. You can look at system, processor, traffic, uh, VPN users, and dive into this and create these views under the monitoring. So they, they both have a way to do it. And Frequently, when you get into the enterprise market, you start piping all the logs and all that NetFlow data to something that can really do it. And there's plenty of projects that support both OpenSense and PFSense for exporting all of that data into something like Grafana and making some really pretty graphs and much more actual intelligence on there. So neither one of them, I think, does an amazing job of giving you the most in-depth reporting, but they both have different ways of handling it. But the NetFlow being natively built in, I thought was you know a plus for the OpenSense side. Now, finally, the question, which one should you use? Now, they're both open source projects. PFSense, though, this is the way they've been doing things. They have their Community Edition, which is just called PFSense CE or Community Edition. And then they have the PFSense Plus, which is the Community Edition with some closed source add-ons on there. There's something similar because I don't believe the full Sensi system is fully open source. So there's add-ons you can get to pay for or buy the licenses for OpenSense. They do have a business model where they sell support and licenses, just like the folks at PFSense and NetGate do. So there's different ways you can have certain components and add-ons put onto these. And this is where people say, well, it's not truly open source if there's add-ons, but the base components are. And it's a lot of nuance you can, you know, uh, spin around and debate about and really uh, go crazy about it if you want. Bottom line of which one you should use, PFSense or OpenSense, I don't know, just use some common sense. That's kind of where I'm going to leave you with this. I'm not here to tell you not to use either one because I think they're both good products. I think they're both secure products. They both have different ways of implementing things from the interface to use a similar uh, underlying system so on there. So I can't make those decisions for you, but hopefully this video helped you understand the two different product bases and let you use your common sense to make a decision that works for you. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. To hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos.